Roof Together, an online service, March 20th, 2022. Faith in a time of fear. Do one thing every day that scares you. Eleanor Roosevelt. Today's welcome is from Sean Garner, Roof's music director. Hello, and welcome to the online service of the Rogue Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, or ROOF, in Ashland, Oregon. I'm Sean Garner, and I'm the music director of our community. During times when we cannot meet safely together in person, these online services keep us connected to each other and to the values of our congregation. We're glad you're here, and we invite you to join us in our mission, embracing diversity, empowering connection, and engaging in the work. Our roof community is an important web of support and connection. Together, we're reminded of our values and encouraged to live them in the world. We begin by acknowledging that our congregation's building is built on land that began as the home of the Cow Creek, Umpqua, Tekelma, Shasta, and Lagawa people. We remind ourselves that indigenous people are part of our communities and continue to experience the effect of colonization and conquest. We are committed to fighting for the worth and dignity of indigenous peoples, both in our community and in the world. We're also committed to work for a world in which the lives, work, bodies, dreams, and leadership of black people are honored and respected. We do this by putting our words, values, and principles into action every day for justice and for the common good. These services are a part of that work. Welcome, and thank you for being here with us. Our chalice lighting words are by John Lennon. There are two basic motivating forces, fear and love. When we are afraid, we pull back from life. When we are in love, we open to all that life has to offer with passion, excitement, and acceptance. Evolution and all hopes for a better world rest in the fearlessness and open-hearted vision of people who embrace life. Our opening song is Do Not Leave Your Cares at the Door. Words by Reverend Norman V. Naylor, music by Elizabeth Alexander, and performed by the Mounds Park Academy Chamber Choir. Do not leave your cares at the door. Do not leave them there when you come into this place. Be open to forgiveness and transformation. Come on in, you are welcome here. And do not leave your cares at the door. Oh, 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 oh. bring your pain and sorrow and joy. There's a place for them upon the altar of life. Be open to forgiveness and transformation. Come on in, you are welcome here. And do not leave your cares at the door. This is a place of grace. Of losing and finding our way upon the winding road. Meeting and parting, stumbling and starting over. Every story is sacred here, even yours, even yours. So come on in and do not leave your cares at the door. Do not leave them there when you come into this place. Be open to forgiveness and transformation. Come on in, you are welcome here. Come in and do not 
leave your cares at the door. Amen. 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 Our peace candle words are by Marie Curie. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. Salam Shalom Peace Salam Shalom Peace Salam Shalom Peace Salam Shalom Today's story is Love Monster by Rachel Bright, read by Sean's Stories. Welcome to Sean's Story. Story time videos for kids every day of the week. Today's story is Love Monster by Rachel Bright. This is a monster. Hello, monster. I think you'll agree. He's a little bit funny looking, to say the least. He lives in a world of cute, fluffy things, which makes being funny looking pretty darn hard. You might have noticed that everybody loves kittens and puppies and bunnies. You know, cute fluffy things. But nobody loves a slightly hairy, I suppose a bit googly eyed, monster. Poor monster. This might be enough to make a monster feel, well, a bit down in the dumps. But not being the moping around sort, he decided to set out and look for someone who'd love him, just the way he was. He looked high, he looked low. He looked middle-ish. He looked inside. And outside. More than once he thought that maybe, just maybe, He'd found what he was looking for, but as it turned out, things were never quite as they seemed.
Yes, it would be fair to say that his search did not go well. And then, it didn't go well some more. It didn't go well for such a long time, in fact, that it began to get dark and scary and, well, not very nice. So the monster, having lost all his oomph, decided it was time to give up and go home. But in the blink of a googly eye, everything changed. You see, sometimes when you least expect it, love finds you. She sat on Rooster's birthday cake. Oh, no. <laughs> On the third Sunday of every month, we give our offering to an organization in our community that we feel embodies our mission and vision. This month, the recipient is the Family Nurturing Center. Prior to meeting my mentor, my life looked like um, overwhelming and impossible. I had been a drug addict for 17 years, in and out of treatments. Um, 10 years I was DHS involved and I had never been able to close a ca case or get a child back. I couldn't hold a job, I couldn't provide stable housing, I couldn't um, obtain a valid driver's license, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't make it to the doctor and I most certainly could not um, live without the use of drugs. The moment I was ready for change was when I was in family court. It was right before I went to treatment for the last time. And sometimes it makes me emotional, but my kids were, were removed. And my daughter was with her dad, whom she barely knew. And the foster dad had brought my son over to have a visit with me. And my son was absolutely heartbroken when he had to leave. And he didn't understand. And in that moment, I realized that I could never do that to him again. And that's really where the change started to happen. The moment that I realized that there was gonna be change was um, my kids were removed from my care from DHS and uh, we had a family decision meeting. Um, my attorney, Sarah Robbins, pulled me out and asked me if I wanted my kids to grow up the way I grew up. Um, or if I was going to break the cycle. And at that point, I surrendered. The Parent Mentor Program started at Family Nurturing Center in 2016 in partnership with the Oregon Department of Human Services LIFE program. LIFE stands for Leveraging Intensive Family Engagement. And the main goal of this program is to conduct casework in a different way that deeply engages the family, encourages parent participation, and achieves permanency for children more quickly. So every participant in the LIFE program is offered a parent mentor and they're able to work with their mentor throughout the course of their child welfare case. So prior to recovery, um, my life looked um, pretty miserable. I was um, very lost. Um, I was homeless. Um, my children had been rescued from me by DHS. Um, I really walked the streets just um, trying to find a way out. The Parent Mentor Program at Family Nurturing Center is unique from all other peer-delivered services in the area because our mentors have personal experience having involvement with the child welfare system. They have all personally experienced their children being placed out of their care and going through the process to regain custody of their children and achieve long-term sobriety. They're able to work with parents to understand how to navigate the system and to be a cheerleader alongside them to remind them that change is possible and to instill hope. The Parent Mentor Program is so impactful because we are able to 
meet our clients where they're at and come from a place of real, true understanding. We not only have been through what they're going through, but we can relate to the feelings that they're having and show them that hope is possible and there is a new way to live. To work alongside her and see the growth that she has flourished into the person that she has become is very rewarding and that's why I do what I do. So Family Nurturing Center's parent mentors have coined themselves with the name The Hope Dealers and it's just what it sounds like. They are paired with parents to deliver hope. They want to remind parents that they deserve to have their children in their lives, their children need them, and that they need to continue being hopeful and working towards their goals. So some advice that I would give somebody who's new in, in recovery and going through some of the things that I went through would be to not let the sideways stuff take you out. Um, if you take a pair of binoculars and you look through a pair of binoculars, you're only going to see what's in front of you. Um, focus on the task at hand and continue to put one foot in front of the other. The sideways stuff will absolutely take you out. So don't see, don't, don't look at it. Don't, don't allow it to just stay focused. When I have a brand on influence in my recovery, I was starting to see the things more clear. He's always looking for me and always, you need to do this, amen, always on the phone or like that. That making my life more easy. I have been able to close my DHS case where a child is in my care and I get to be a mom today. Um, she taught me how to live, like how to think normally, how to understand um, how people were communicating to me in a way where I didn't have to live in fight or flight, like I could actually understand what they were telling me and move through the process in a healthy way. Um, yeah, I, I'm really grateful for my parent, peer mentor. To give by mail, send your gift to Roof at 87 4th Street, Ashland, Oregon, 97520. Please write Third Sunday Offering in the memo line so that we can get it to the Family Nurturing Center. To give online, go to familynurturingcenter.org slash donate. If you need support during these hard times, Contact Reverend Sean using the form on roof.org. We will do our best to help. For these gifts which enable us to enact our mission and for all the gifts you bring into this world, thank you. Our reading today is Breaking Up with Our Culture of Fear, an excerpt by Dana Hall McCain. Read by Boyce Brown. Breaking Up with Our Culture of Fear by Dana Hall McCain. Our culture is addicted to fear and rage. It is fed to us on a loop by social media gurus and cable news producers who have looked at the numbers and understand that it's the most effective button they can push to keep us engaged. They give us big things to fear and absolute villains to hate. This effective strategy has not been lost on political consultants either. They use their campaign dollars to push the same button with the hope of driving you to the polls. And we drink from that well deeply, day in, day out, until we're almost sick with despair. So. How do we get off the anxiety, rage, merry-go-round and tap into the peace that our faith promises? This war is won or lost 
largely on the inputs we allow into our lives and how we balance those. Sure, we all need to get the news and be informed about what's happening in the world around us, but drinking from a fire hydrant of information and commentary around the clock <laughs> is terrible for our hearts and minds. I had a conversation in recent years with a pastor friend who lamented his declining ability to influence his congregation. He noted that he only had them for one hour per week. Cable news and digital medium had them all day, every day. I just can't compete with that, he said. He lamented the fact that his congregants thought they were just getting information from those other sources. In reality, they were consuming media in such massive doses they were being formed by it socially, spiritually, and otherwise. Something calls me back to balance. I crave more time with a hot cup of coffee and an open book. I crave music that celebrates a love so great that the God of the universe came down to dwell among us. I crave time with people I love more than a packed schedule, and when I follow those cravings, I find more peace and less fear, more patience and grace for others, and less anger. We can choose to break up with our culture of fear. Trust me, friends, he's a horrible boyfriend who has lied to us and robbed us of joy that was rightfully ours and we can do better please center yourself in a spirit of meditation or prayer to when i am frightened by shelley dunham nicole collins vocals lark lewis piano from the minnesota valley uu fellowship
Our sharing today is Faith in a Time of Fear by Reverend Sean. Fear is a terrible boyfriend, a terrible partner, and a very dangerous thing to let grow in and among us. Fear is also a form of currency in this world. Because the job of the media, as my friend and professional media consultant, Helio Fred Garcia says, is to deliver eyeballs in the form of viewers of television and media. There is a very real effort to make every one of us tune in to whatever programs or apps or stories or websites will capture our attention. Making us afraid is the easiest way to draw our eyeballs to a screen and convert our attention into dollars by telling us that we will feel better if we buy these things. Fear is a terrible partner because it doesn't really want to be partners, equal in power and love and covenant. It wants to manipulate us and convince us that we don't dare do anything but attend to it. Feed it, clothe it, protect it, provide it shelter, clean up its messes, always reacting, reacting, reacting in something even closer to panic. Fear wants us to be dependent, even addicted to cycles of trauma, and then to whatever will soothe us or help us forget. Fear wants us to squeeze our eyes shut and ignore everything except what it is saying. Fear is barbed wire fences and border walls and the lie that there is a wrong side of the tracks, a wrong neighborhood, a wrong grammar, a wrong language, and that we will find ourselves trapped there with the have-nots, the loveless, the damned, the condemned. Fear teaches us that there are humans and monsters and that monsters will never be loved, will never be held, will never be long. Fear curses us in a way that makes us believe in those monsters more than we believe in the magic that transforms the beast back into human form or finds a way to place a ward that will guard and protect us without the risk of making us monsters too. Fear is a weaver of nightmares where we are always isolated, always alone, and unable to find our loved ones, our community, the power of people coming together and not doomed to fight or run or survive or sacrifice alone. Fear separates. It relies on the categories of us and them, the one that divides in order to cut us off from empathy and compassion. Fear is never a good boyfriend or partner or friend. I'm not saying there's nothing to be afraid of, nothing to fear. Of course that isn't true. But the trick that fear plays on us is to divide us from each other and from ourselves because we start to believe and internalize its stories that say nothing can be done or no one can be trusted. This is where faith comes in. Not faith as some kind of right belief that will save us after the terrible end. Not faith as a way to separate humanity from monsters and prove that we are one and not the other. Not faith that excuses violence in pursuit of banishing monsters or enemies or evil as a whole. Not faith that is rooted in the same soil as fear. But instead, faith that reminds us we are not alone. We have each other, and we have all those who have not capitulated to the ideology and machinations of fear. We have Ukrainian grandmothers with handfuls of seeds, with faith in sunflowers of the future, even while facing the soldiers of the present. We have Russian news anchors who hold up signs that say they are lying to you, even while they know how much that truth will cost them. We have Polish mothers leaving baby carriages and strollers at train stations for the children of the refugees who have not, parent or child, known rest for days and nights as they flee. 
Faith also reminds us that all is not lost, no matter the words of hopelessness and despair told with such bluster by fear in its costume of lies. Faith asks us to be brave enough not to look away, but to bring our eyes and our hearts and our minds toward the world, toward the people and the planet, and to transmute the anxiety and powerlessness we feel into faithfulness, faithfulness that grows our compassion and our generosity and our creativity. Faith asks us to remember we can find a way, any way at all, to respond, to do something, some small thing that aligns with our faith in how the world should be. Fear wants us to quit. Its strategy is to overwhelm us with terror until we feel we can do nothing, nothing but surrender to the inevitable. Faith says, no, it doesn't have to be this way. I will do what I can do to create another truth, another path, another outcome. Faith even says it's okay to rest sometimes, to smile, to love, to feel joy even in these terrible times. Most of all, faith reminds us to stick together, to care for the frightened, to resist anything that dehumanizes another, even an enemy. Faith reminds us to look for those who allow boy soldiers captured in a brutal occupation to not only eat a meal and drink a cup of warm tea, but to call their mothers, countering the lies that feed them fear as well. There may not be a way we can reverse all that has been done or retrieve all that has been lost. We may not be able to hold all the images of sorrow we are being subjected to in the name of fear. We may need to shut off our phones, take a sabbatical from our news feeds and seek out beauty and rest to remind us that peace is possible even if it is incremental and there is no fast and simple way to move from here to there. Fear wants us to give up. It wants us to collapse and become cynical and hopeless. That is the opposite of what I mean when I talk about faith. I want us to be a faithful people, faithful to our principles, to our commitments to dignity and justice and peace and a world made whole by interdependence, that deep connected togetherness that is the way we will survive. Faith sings, we know that we need each other, every one of us to survive. And yes, faith says it's okay to sing. Faith says singing is necessary. Faith says one of the ways we endure and find the way to a different ending is to not stop singing and to do it together, not abandoning anyone and never abandoning hope. Faith is so deeply necessary, even revolutionary in these times of fear. Let us remember all the ways we can be faithful, all the ways we cannot and will not stop singing or shouting or crying or praying. May it be so. May we be the ones that make it so. Amen. Ashe and blessed be. Our closing song is We Will Not Stop Singing, written by the Chapin sisters, Lily and Abigail, arranged by Adam Pod, featuring the First Unitarian Brooklyn Choir. We will not stop singing song till the world can
and sing along. We will not stop marching. We will not stop marching. We will not stop marching till the world can hear the song, till the world can sing along, till the world can sing, till the world can sing, till the world can sing. Our closing words are by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The moment we begin to fear the opinions of others and hesitate to tell the truth that is in us and from motives of policy are silent when we should speak, the divine floods of light and life no longer flow into our souls. <laughs>